Welcome to my podcast, Shaping Your Journey. My name is Aldo Matza, percussionist, drummer, and artistic director of Cosa Music, inviting you to join in in conversation with friends, artists, professionals, and experts in the music world. Today I have the wonderful opportunity to catch up with a, with a friend who's a, also all of, the, all of the above. And I want to thank you, Jonathan Haas, for uh, from joining me from New York in this uh, conversation. Aldo, when you call, we all run. <laughs> <laughs> Do you? <laughs> thank you for having me. Oh, no, thank, thank you, John. You're, you're the best. And, and there's, I mean, a lot more than, than people think. Um, well, people know you. They, they, people who know you, of course, know that. But uh, you are one of those other forces on the planet that it, it's important for us to have around. Because it's, it's, it's nice to have uh, inspiration from people who are inspired, paying attention, interested, interesting, and all of the above. But before I, I ask you... Um, I lead you into some of the questions I have in mind. Just tell us um, from the very beginning, what was that thing that triggered you to start your music world, music uh, trajectory, if you will, from the beginning? Well, uh, the beginning uh, was thanks to my sister who told my parents that if I didn't stop banging on all the pots and pans and at the dinner table, that she was going to see a a quick demise uh, of her younger brother. So that's when I first got sent to the basement to start drumming. And I think a lot of people know what I'm talking about. That basement, boy, that saved my life. Nice. <laughs> nice. But then you, you studied at Juilliard, um, if I'm not mistaken, right? As, as far as formation and, and music training? Well, my uh, uh, my trajectory was uh, different than some, and then I went to Washington University in St. Louis as an undergraduate um, student with no intention and no idea of being a musician or being a music major. So my first uh, year, about a year and a half at Wash, at Wash U, was basically learning anthropology, political science, game theory, and all that. While I was at the same time, the reason I went there was to study with Rich O'Donnell, who was the principal percussionist of the St. Louis Symphony. And little did I know that there were three additional and iconic percussionists um, in the St. Louis Symphony at the time. So that uh, what I got myself into, I had no idea I was getting myself into. And it was the most glorious four years of my life uh, as a student in my student years. And it was the influence of Rich O'Donnell, Rick Holmes, who was the principal timpanist of the St. Louis Symphony, John Kasica, who was basically the mouth player, and Tom Stubbs, who were not only my teachers, but I became very, very good friends with them. Uh, so when I was at Wash U, it wasn't until my sophomore year that I decided to become a music major. I had No one in my family was a musician other than my sister had played the cello, which is why she threatened me as a percussionist, but that's a, that's a much longer story. Um, and it really all began, it began in St. Louis uh, with a lot of very, very interesting opportunities that I had. Some of them real pluses and some of them, uh, some of them would be considered as minuses because at the time that I was really thinking about becoming a musician, there were other people telling me uh, how difficult it was and you know, maybe you're not cut out for it and all that good stuff. But when you're young you're and you're hungry for knowledge and experience, you cast aside the naysayers. And I think you bring forward those who are encouraging you. And that's exactly what I did. Beautiful. And, and then did you uh, but then did you study at Juilliard after that? How did that come into the so, picture? Yeah. So I, I, I made what I would consider now to be a, a, a terrible decision. Um, in that I only applied to one school to study with one teacher. And if that didn't work out, then it was going to be bust. I wasn't going to do it. And that teacher was Sal Goodman, and that school was the Juilliard School. And I put all my eggs in one basket, uh, which I don't advise. I don't think that was a, <laughs> the, the greatest of decisions. Um, but with, uh, uh, with a little bit of luck and uh, having worked very hard, 
um, I was able to uh, get into Mr. Goodman's studio at Juilliard and then subsequently moved to New York, which I did not want to do. I'm a Midwesterner and New York was a very scary place for me. Um, that I went uh, to Juilliard for three years uh, to get my master's degree and then a year of um, artist diploma work. And uh, it turned out uh, that it remains my home. Yes, yes. And, and, and I remember... When you and I met, you had finished, uh, you were on a, <laughs> this, this is interesting, uh, this brings us back, and I, it was an re- interesting story. You were on tour with uh, ELP, Electric, uh, no, not Electric, the Emerson, Emerson Lake and Palmer, Lake and Palmer. <laughs> Orchestra, right, which, which, by the way, I had auditioned for also, but yes, 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 and they did uh, uh, auditions in Montreal and I think somewhere else. But then I understood later that they decided to take the whole orchestra from New York. So, so this, is, this, this is really interesting, Jonathan, because one day I was, I was still at McGill University with, studying there. I walk out, and you were standing in front of the building, and you asked me where the percussion studio was. So I don't know if you remember this. I remember then, it was like yesterday. That was you? Yes. Oh, my gosh. I, I yes, know. yes, yes, yes. <laughs> And and then and then I said, okay, no, no, let me take you up. So I showed you around the studio because you were curious. You were in town with uh, uh, Emerson Lake and Palmer, and uh, I showed you around the studio. And I I don't think Pierre Belleuse, our teacher, was there that day, but I showed you around and we became good friends. And then consequently, you really helped me out. You may not remember that. I was getting ready for my final, um, either my final or my semi-final e- exam with, in front of a jury. And everybody was playing, always playing the same pieces. And, and so you, I, I asked you, I said, do you have anything that, that you might suggest that, that you're doing? So you sent me the music, Leenda. Do you remember that? Of, uh, right, right. Albanese Leenda that John Kasica had arranged for solo vibraphone. Yeah. Beautiful piece. And I played it on marimba. And um, and that that became I mean that made me different from everybody else because nobody could I, they wouldn't have to compare me or or that or they couldn't compare me to anybody else <laughs> in the performance, which helped me out. And then everybody loved the piece so much it became part of the repertoire they they con- they continued using in those uh, exams at, at the end of the year. So wow, I, that that I did not know. The wonderful story, and I do I had, remember it was very vivid. Yeah, so that was that was that was nice, and and of course we became, we continued our, our friendship. And you've been a, a real uh, force majeure in uh, in New York. You are teaching at NYU, and you're also, I mean, you also have you know associations with, I mean, Philip Glass. Tell us a little bit about your work with Philip Glass, because I you mentioned him a lot, and of course he's one of the great composers of our time. Uh, well. I met Philip Glass because of my mother. And I think we all have to take a moment and both celebrate our parents and or our loved ones who supported us. And my mother was my clipping service. So I'd be in New York and on a fairly regular basis coming from Chicago, I would get little snippets out of the New York Times, anything that had to do with percussion, anything. She'd cut and paste, and then I would get it in a in a uh, a nice tidy envelope. So she sends me a little article. Um, in fact, I have it on my desk, and it says, uh, in a very long paragraph, a mention that Philip Glass had written a piece for timpani and double bass for a production of uh, Endgame that was done in Massachusetts, and that uh, that it was called Prelude to Endgame for timpani and double bass. And that's all it said. And I went, timpani and double bass, Philip Glass, holy cow, that's fantastic. I wonder how I can find the music. Um, and at that time, Philip Glass was a member of Local 802. He was still playing professionally, and he actually was still driving a taxi cab. Um, wow. So that I found his name in the union uh, in the union book, and I called him up um fearlessly and i said you know philip you don't know who i am but i hear you wrote a piece for timpani and double bass and i i'd like to take a look at it and he said well why don't you come over to my house 
And I went, I'll be there in a minute. And uh, I hopped in a cab, went down. Uh, he's over on uh, East Third in the East Village. He welcomed me into his house. He said to me, I had really no idea that anybody would ever be interested in this as a concert piece because he had written it for uh, for the play Endgame. And I asked him, I said, can I have permission to, to, you know, do some things with your piece? And he said, absolutely. So uh, I had a recital planned at the 92nd Street Y in New York City, which is an iconic uh, concert venue for those who uh, may not New York know New yes. York that well. Nice theater. Nice theater. Yes. Nice theater. And this became the centerpiece for my recital knowing that I had what was considered the world premiere of the performance as a solo. And what I did is I rearranged it for eight timpani and electric bass. And I hired the iconic bass player, John Beale, who remains a very good friend of mine. And uh, we rented a studio at Carol's Studios, invited Philip to come to the studio. And we did this version for... Uh, eight timpani and electric bass where I took half of the bass part and played it on timpani. And while I was playing the timpani part that is now the bass part, the bass player was playing the timpani part on, on bass. Wow. Phil loved it. He loved it. He said, it's, it's a hit. And so we did, did it on my recital uh, at the 92nd street Y and that became a, a very long and very generous relationship that I've had with Philip uh, since then, and he's written me a timpani concerto that I've been around the world about one and a half times playing, except uh, I have not yet been in Africa or Russia. Um, Africa, I'd love to go to. Russia is not uh, on the radar at this point. And uh, it's, uh, it's, it's been a very, very enriching experience to know somebody of, uh, of Philip's uh, renown and musical curiosity as well, because it sure took someone curious to write a double timpani concerto, I'll tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> no kidding. It, it's amazing. And being able to dig those things up. It, it's really nice when people like that help you in, in along your path. Because, I mean, obviously it helps them too. But, but I mean, having that, you know, you, you, said, a, you said a word that I, I love is that curiosity. Like being curious, I think, is that thing that 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 pulls us into into situations or pulls us and or and pushes us also into doing things that other people may not see, but it pulls us and our our curiosity. And I think it's important to, to remain curious, you know. It, it well, keeps you growing. Sure, absolutely, Aldo. I, I that, that's what keeps us all, you know, evolving and uh looking into new possibilities and digging up some of the old ones and changing them or revising them. But uh, uh, curiosity and music and being an artist are one and the same. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and I read somewhere, you had, and I had no idea about this, you had done a, a recital at Carnegie Hall that, was it a timpani recital only or... Well, it was strictly the, timpani, nice. Yeah, it, was, it, was the, it was the first timpani recital in... Uh, Carnegie Hall was in Carnegie Recital Hall, um, and the centerpiece of that concert was uh, Stockhausen's Schlag Trio, which had never been performed in the United States. So I was actually able to get him to give me permission to do that piece at at Carnegie Hall, and that turned out to be a a, a great success, both for myself musically as well as I think the instrument, because going into that recital. I had applied to the Martha Baird Rockefeller Foundation, um, prestigious foundation giving money to, for people's Carnegie Hall recitals for their debut. So I applied the first time. And I laugh now. It, uh, at first, it was not funny. And I received a response letter from the Martha Baird Rockefeller Foundation. Dear Mr. Haas, thank you so much for applying to the foundation for your solo debut as a timpanist. Unfortunately, uh, we're sorry to inform you, but the foundation only supports musical instruments. <laughs> no, that, that's in writing. Not only is it in writing. Beautiful, beautiful, John. So I, I looked at the letter in shock and disbelief, and I went, somebody doesn't understand what I'm trying to do. A story of my life, by the way, so, uh, which is fine. 
And I called up the Rockefeller Foundation, got a very nice secretary on the phone, and I explained to her a significant mistake has been made in my application. And I'd like to speak to the head of the Rockefeller Foundation. And she said, oh, well, Mr. Haas, by looking at your application, and I said, there, there's been a significant mistake, and I, I need this meeting. So oh, I went, uh, I, I was given the meeting uh, with wow. the gentleman and went over to Rockefeller Center, where the Christmas tree is right now, and went up to the third floor and these big offices and oak doors and leather couches and very imposing. And I sat down in this big leather chair and I said to this nice man, I said, very, very serious oversight at the Rockefeller Foundation in your response to me. And the gentleman says to me, oh, how, how so? And I said to him, do you happen to know who one of the highest paid musicians in all of the U.S. orchestras, what instrument they play? And he said, oh, well, I would imagine it would be the principal oboe or the concert or the, violinist. Or yeah, concert the French master. horn. And I said, no. I said that the highest paid musician in the United States right now is the principal timpanist of the Boston Symphony. His name is Vic Firth. Um, and he said, well, oh, I've, I've heard his name, but I had no idea. And I said, well, the reason I'm bringing this up is that your letter says that you only support musical instruments. And I said, the timpanist, who is the highest paid musician in the United States, that's a musical instrument. So he looks at the letter. And he sort of scratches his head and he says, you're right. This was a real oversight. And I said, well, I would like to be considered for the, the granting of, of the from the foundation. By the way, this would have, this paid for the entire Carnegie Recital Hall cost, which was not small. Right. So then this was like being in the Wizard of Oz, where you have to bring the hat of the Wicked Witch of the West, I think it was, and they brought the broomstick and that wasn't enough. So the gentleman says to me, okay, so here's what we're going to do. Uh, you're going to play a half hour timpani recital for experts in the field, and they will determine whether you your instrument can be considered for this foundation support. And I went, okay. So I, at my own expense, I rented Carol's Studios. Uh, Bill Mersch, uh, the, the marimbist and one of my closest and best friends, he and I had just commissioned a piece by Erwin Bazelon called Partnership for Marimba and Timpani. So we played that. I had a piece for electronic timpani, uh, uh, electronic tape and timpani. And then I had several of the Carter pieces and I also hired the New York Gay Men's Choir. And we did a performance of Samuel Barber's A Stopwatch and an Ordnance Map for male choir and solo timpani. So we put on, I put on this recital, and it was 45 minutes, not a half hour. And I looked at all the experts at the table, very nice people. And basically, their jaws had dropped to the floor. And I said, what do you think? This is a solo instrument. And they all went, we had no idea that wow. you could do things like this. All right. Now, fast forward to the recital. No, no response from the Rockefeller Foundation. I begged, borrowed, and stole money from uh, all my relatives to pay for it and paid for it myself. Put on the recital, and by the way, Bill Ludwig and Sal Goodman actually sat next to each other at my recital without <gasps> without fighting. Um, <laughs> I would have loved to see that one. Oh, that, that was a, a glorious moment. And at the end of my recital, it's over, and nice job. A nice lady, her name was Kathy Hager. I'll never forget this. She comes up to me, and she said, Hi, I'm Kathy Hager from the Martha Baird Rockefeller Foundation. Um, and I want to tell you how much I enjoyed your recital. And she took out of her jacket pocket a check for the entire cost of the recital. Wow. And I was wow. very grateful. And what I understood this as was meaningful in that when you stay the course, when you know you, you're committed and you have the conviction, I never anticipated that that's how that they would respond. 
But I felt very much that I was representing both the instrument and the music that I was playing and that it was genuine. Well, I was tested. I was tested as far as you can test somebody all the way through doing the actual recital and having some. She could have just left the hall with the check in her pocket, right? So yes. it really taught me very early on about being determined, the determination in doing something, but that when it's based on some when it's based on something that you love so much that you're going to do it no matter what obstacles are going to be in the way. I just highly recommend that as a as a pathway. And I've had plenty of uh, uh, disappointments and I have plenty of rejections and all that kind of stuff as well. But having this happen early on, it was encouraging for projects and opportunities that led into my future. Beautiful. That that's a great story, John. And I and I think I mean anybody listening, I mean the what comes to mind is like having the t tenacity. I mean, we all know. I mean, you're always going to have rejections. People are just not going to see what you see. But uh, coming from a place of 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 genuine artist, genuine, you believe something. And you know this is some. I mean, timpani not being a musical instrument that that's huge. And especially today, I mean, if it was 150 years ago, you know, one could say, well, there's a lot of work to do. But today, there's really no excuse. So I'm really happy to hear that you took that on nicely. You know, you you have to take these things on in such a way that the people are you know not offended, of course, right. because sometimes they it's not their fault that they don't know. You know, so you have to take that position. So you have, we have to help them out. And, and you did it the right way. You really helped them out, I'll say. <laughs> Seriously, because, uh, you know, and you've, I mean, since, since then, of course, you've done a lot more work on timpani. And I've seen you perform timpani. You're a, I mean, you're a great player, of course. Great teacher, I know that. And then, I mean, you, you've also done some things uh, in Frank Zappa, a recording. What was that? The specific project well uh, the the frank zappa saga is very much uh similar to philip glass and and even the carnegie recital hall um frank zappa put out a recording with uh, pierre boulez and it was called the perfect right. stranger with the group the into contemporary in in france i remember and, yes 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 um I have always been a huge fan of Frank Zappa. In fact, their first tour, I was 13 years old and they came to the Ravinia Festival in Chicago. And I heard the Mothers of Invention with Ainsley Dunbar running up and down the aisles and people basically going, we think the aliens have landed and they're playing music. <laughs> it was the strangest, most bizarre experience I actually think I've ever had next to playing with Sun Ra. Yeah, and um, I, saw, I saw that group, so I know what you're talking about <laughs> when yeah, I was a kid, yeah, it, too. Yeah, it was it was way out there. And, and I loved every minute of it. So uh, fast forward, I hear this recording that Zappa has done the album. It says Perfect Stranger, Pierre Belez and blah, blah, blah. Good. So I listened to the album and I said to myself, Boy, what would be a great concert would be to play The Perfect Stranger, the album, all the pieces on, on that, and Verez's Desert, because it was a perfect match in terms of Zappa used uh, electronic interpolations between the instrumental movements and the same thing Verez had done. In fact, we had played the Verez underneath the St. Louis Arch with the St. Louis Symphony um at the bicentennial and i had played it with the percussion section uh with the orchestra um the st louis symphony so i was I, I knew the piece very well so i went well what should i do now i i, I want to do this concert of, uh, and do these two pieces together well i gotta get i gotta write zappa so this was back in the day with the dinosaurs and something called the post office where you would put a stamp on an envelope and you would write to somebody. It was concurrently, I think, at the same time as the dinosaurs. And I wrote a letter to Zappa. And I said, Dear Mr. Zappa, you don't know who I am, but um, I'd like to do The Perfect Stranger uh, uh, along with Verez. Um, what do you think? And it would be so nice uh, if we could do this. All right. It was a very pleasant letter. 
And I mailed it to his publishing company, which at the time was called Barfco Swill. That was the name of Zampa's uh, his public, and it was on the el- on the record album. Right. And that was the only contact I knew. So right to his publisher. So I write Barfco Swill, and the lady at the at the uh, post office, she goes, "That doesn't look like a real address." And I go, "No, that's that's the name. <laughs> that's the name." <laughs> So, uh, and I mail it. It's like you put a, you, if you put a message in a bottle and you throw it into the Atlantic Ocean and, you know, maybe somebody in the Pacific Ocean will find it. That's what it felt like. So I also left him my phone number and that I was going to spend my first summer on the faculty of the Aspen Music Festival and School in Colorado. So I gave him that information. Uh, it was in the springtime, obviously, because uh, the summer festival. And on the first day that I arrived at the Aspen Music Festival, and I go to check in with the nice secretary who's going to give me the faculty packet. And here's, she says, she hands me a piece of paper and she goes, uh, 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 Jonathan, we, uh, you received a phone call from Frank Zappa. And he <laughs> called the Aspen Music Festival. And I looked at this nice person and I laughed and I said, ha, 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 the funny joke. But I'm thinking, how how would this person who doesn't know me at all know that I had written a letter to Frank Zappa? Right. So I'm sort of thinking, yes, 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 yes. Okay, maybe we need to look at this a little bit further. So she gives me, it says Frank Zappa on it, phone number in, uh, in California. I call the number. And somebody picks up the phone and I go, uh, hello, uh, I'm calling Frank Zappa. This is Jonathan Haas calling. And the next thing I know is this person on the other line starts yelling. I know what you want to do. You want to put on a concert and play one of my pieces and put a whole bunch of crappy composers on the concert. So everybody comes, hears all the crappy composers and nobody really listens to mine. And I was about a two minute tirade. (laughs) And I say, is this Frank Zappa? And he goes, who do you think it is? And Aldo, you said no bad words, but (laughs) who who do you think this is? And I go, well, Mr. Zappa, if you'd read my letter, you would see that I had indicated that I wanted to play the perfect stranger along with the Verez Desert, because I thought you had modeled the perfect stranger after Verez, who was your hero. Right. Silence on the phone. That's a really good idea. And I go, you like it? And he goes, yeah. He said, the perfect stranger is one of the tunes that's on the entire album. The album's not called The Perfect Stranger. It's just one of the tunes. And I said, oh, I thought it was like Desert represented Verez's entire piece. We did did it. it. We did it at Avery Fisher Hall. It took 10 years. Wow. Wow. 10 years. uh, We almost did it at the Palladium in New York, uh, where Zappa did a lot of concerts, um, both with his band as well as with classical musicians. And we ended up doing it at Avery Fisher Hall, but it took me 10 years to convince Lincoln Center that this was going to be a sellout. And not only was it a sellout, they wanted to do a midnight concert, the line around Avery Fisher Hall. And for those of you who may not be there, we're talking about six to seven city blocks. The line went around the block six times for people to get into the concert. Wow. And it was my plan to because i did ask frank zappa to write a timpani concerto before i asked philip glass and unfortunately we lost frank zappa uh at at a much too early age much uh, too young much too young early and that did not take place um so what i did is that my second hero composer was philip glass which is why i went to him after zappa wasn't going to work out uh and I went to Philip Glass. So those stories are connected. Beautiful, beautiful. I, I mean, and, and that's that's the other thing. I mean, one, like you said earlier, when, when you're convinced of something, you have to go for it because no one else will. That's, that's, that's the other thing. 
and 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 usually people like Zap or any anybody else. I mean, they're they're just human. And as long as you're sincere and you're legit and you're doing something that that is has value. I mean, I've had the same same experience, by the way. Uh, in some in some instances, not not quite Frank Zappa, but you know, you you have to have the the nerve to say, I really need to do this, and you do it. It's it's like when I showed up at at. I called a meeting with Rodrigo, the composer, in Madrid. You know, we were, uh, we did some some touring in Madrid, and we had just finished uh, his piece, Concierto Andaluz, four guitars, right? And we arranged it for four marimbas and orchestra with repercussion. And there was a problem. Um, one of the parts, and I happened to be playing that part, it was a, a, a descending line, like a bass line on the marimba, that goes down to the E. Well, our marimba only went down to the F. And uh, so uh, as, as I'm trying to get some of the manufacturers to go down, to make the instrument to go down that low, in the meantime, I said, I want to record this piece. And, and while, I'm, while we're in Spain, I want to get permission from Rodrigo. So I set up a meeting, sent him the recordings ahead of time. They said, send us some things. So I sent some recordings. Um, and, and so I, I was there in a, a meeting in Rodrigo's house, okay? So you have like these four people in a panel, and I'm talking and I'm playing the piece that we had just recorded with, uh, I think it was the Quebec Symphony that we, we had just done it with. And I said, I'd like to get Wright's first recording, but there's one problem. We have to, I have to go up the octave to go down to the, to go up to the E and not go down to the E. So it was just a minor change. Can I do that? And may we have. So they're all sitting there, you know, with their glasses down to here like this, you know, watching. So it was very intimidating. They didn't say a word. And they're saying, so you're four percussionists. And so they couldn't, they didn't register that four percussionists doing this piece that was written for guitar, for guitars, Los Romeros, and orchestra. So they're listening to the piece. They're listening to other things we're doing. They turn around, they're speaking to each other. At the time, I didn't speak Spanish, so I didn't really know what, what they were saying. So then they turn around, and Rodrigo says, said, I should have written this for you guys. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so, you know, I'm sweating, right? I'm saying, oh, my God, they, they're going to throw me out of here. Or, you know, down the, not even by the door, by the window. Because, you know, they have these serious classical people and their look and, the, and their look, they looked me and they turned around and it was a surprise. And they said, I had no idea that you can make such music out of those instruments, but you guys have really impressed. And I said, well, would you consider writing another piece? <laughs> and he said, you know, I haven't written something in a while, but now you, you have me curious and let's talk about it. Shortly after he passed, though, that was, you know, the other story. But I, so I floated out of there, <laughs> you know, oh, you know, and you, I mean, the, basically what I'm saying is like you, you don't take, take no for an answer. And sometimes the no is yourself giving, giving yourself that no, that you can't do it, that you shouldn't, and all the forces would be against you. But that's not true. People are open if you just give them the opportunity to, to experience it, or at least consider it, right? Well, it has to, it has to have the two-way street. I, I, I'll give you an example of something that has not worked out, but I'm not giving up. Um, I've, I've had the idea of Eminem writing me a timpani concerto, um, and he's just so, he's very protected by his people. Right. And we're talking about lawyers, and we're talking about, you know, real 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 people who do protect him and i understand all that i mean he's a he's a, a megastar um but in contrast to frank zappa who i would have thought what had the same layers of protection he was answering his own phone so i think it depends on you know the artist and how accessible they can be want to be and are willing to be um and so once in a while, you'll you'll get to somebody and, you know, Lady Gaga, I don't think is going to write me a timpani concerto, for instance. So I, I, I haven't even considered that. 
Um, but then there's been a lot of other people who uh, who I've thought of, and it it, it is interesting, and I, and I share very much the same story. We're all we're all these we're all people. We're all human beings and creative artists. And I think that when you really show that you're for real and that your intentions are all well, well and good, is when you can have a lot of success in comparison to a lot of failures. Sure, sure. And and you had you did have a piece written for you. You you mentioned this to me by Lenny White. Nice. You surprised me, John. He's That's, he's he surprised himself. He's surprising everybody. I've I've had an opportunity to become really good friends with Lenny, and I've commissioned several pieces from him now. A big percussion ensemble piece that NYU uh, is going to do the New York premiere uh, was part of a collaboration with the Aspen Music Festival and School, uh, along with a piece that uh, uh, Tim Adams wrote uh, called Eight Forty Six, which is a tribute to the George Floyd. Uh, saga that he is uh, uh, creating a uh, a lasting memory and tribute to. Um, and Lenny as well uh, was very open to the possibility of writing for percussion ensemble. Um, that went so well, continues to go so well. So he was the perfect person for me to ask for a hip hop timpani piece. Because <laughs> I spent COVID basically studying hip hop and falling in love with the art form. Nice. Some of the words, some of the words are uh, a little bit beyond me, but uh, aside from the words, the music and the harmony and the beats and all that, I, I find to be just incredibly interesting and intriguing. And I wanted to play timpani uh, on a on a hip hop piece. I wanted a hip hop timpani piece, so Lenny wrote it. Um, he composed it, and he got the uh, the. Uh, hip hop artist uh, who lives in Indiana, Walter, to to do the lyrics, and uh, we're almost done uh, because our visual is going to be done by one of the iconic uh, cartoonists, um, Alex uh, Bransky, um, and it's going to take him about six months to do cartoons. It takes a long time to do cartoons. I did not realize that animation. It's not cartoons like a like a funny ha ha thing. Uh, he's an animator and okay. world okay. renowned. So I'm putting all these different elements together, and soon we will present to the world our first hip hop timpani piece. Beautiful, and and of course you, you mentioned you're going to send the uh, the track to me, and we'll put it on this podcast. Absolutely, and we'll play it, and we'll do it rather than you play it there. We're going to put it, uh, uh, we'll edit it in so that it sounds like the way you want it. Take away the lights and the likes, all the apps and the sites, all the wrongs with your rights and the praise. Take away the clothes and the shows and the superficial goals and the weight of what your soul really weighs. Take away the memes and the streams, the machines, the regimes and the screens telling lies like the truth. Take away the greed and the need to impede and mislead in the end, the only thing left is you. Take away the lights and the likes, all the apps and the sites, all the wrongs with your rights and the praise. Take away the clothes and the shows and the superficial goals and the weight of what your soul really weighs. Take away the memes and the streams, the machines, the regimes and the screens telling lies like the truth. Take away the greed and the need to impede and mislead in the end, the only thing left is you. Uh, are you living or you really just survive? Are you driven or you really just connive? If peace comes at a cost, then I'm buying. In this world, it's get rich or die trying. I seen a man lose his soul trying to chase fame, but all the money in the world won't erase pain. Sometimes you go crazy trying to stay sane, but inner peace is the part you gotta maintain. Are you living or you really just surviving? Are you driven or you really just conniving? If peace comes at a cost, then I'm buying. In this world, it's get rich or die trying. I seen a man lose his soul trying to chase fame But all the money in the world won't erase pain Sometimes you'll go crazy trying to stay sane But inner peace is the part you gotta maintain Breakdown, my heart beat like the timpani, what a great sound I lost my mind in the same place that hate's found My phone screen got me walking with my face down Welcome to the algorithm takedown 
The dopamine rushes like a tall tide As we hang up on the truth just to call lies Dark thoughts got my mind spinning like ball ties But you know trash only draws flies They don't wanna see you winning, they would rather see you broke Haters used to do me dirty, now they laugh at me and soak This for all the broken dreamers doing bad and need a hope God must have a sense of humor, this life has to be a joke Cause the whole world feels like a big grief fair You're born then you get taxed just to breathe air all this sinning just for winning, man, we need prayer But when it comes to the bands, I'm the lead chair Used to dream of the bands with the frog eyes Riding with the top hill back like bald guys I love all types, all shapes, all sizes Brown lives, black lives, white lives, all lives Something's gotta change, something's gotta give We just wanna thrive, we just wanna live We can't keep on suffering, the people had enough of it Let's overcome the struggle and then get back to the love Take away the lights and the likes, all the apps and the sites All the wrongs with your rights and the praise Take away the clothes and the shows And the superficial goals And the weight of what your soul really weighs Take away the memes and the streams The machines, the regimes and the screens Telling lies like they're true Take away the greed and the need To impede and mislead In the end, the only thing left is you Take away the lights and the likes All the apps and the sites All the wrongs with your rights and the praise Take away the clothes and the shows and the superficial goals and the weight of what your soul really weighs take away the memes and the streams the machines the regimes and the screens telling lies like they're true take away the greed and the need to impede and mislead in the end the only thing left is you yeah no no this yeah, is great I, I got excited at uh, hip hop timpani and of course, Lenny White is, is brilliant. I've, I remember seeing him many times with uh, Chick Corea, Return Forever to Forever, and I have all their records. And then for years, I was trying to get him to come to COSA. As I tried to get you, you were, you were so busy at the Aspen School every summer. And Lenny was always on tour or producing. I mean, in the past, in, in the last part, I remember he was producing a singer in Naples and Italy and, and touring or... or Really being super busy, and that never happened. But he's 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 a brilliant percussionist, musician. Period. And, yeah. he's, he's, and he's writing for a symphony orchestra now, which is really really fascinating. He's he's very adept at it, of course, having played with the greatest musicians who've ever lived. And now his uh, his newfound passion of of writing symphonic works. Wow. Uh, we're doing a lot of them at NYU with with our orchestra. And I hope that other people, uh, if they uh, are inspired to do so, to contact me if they'd like uh, to have access and to get to know Lenny. He is a just a wonderful, wonderful human being, and uh, certainly one of, one of our most uh, important beacons for creativity in the percussion world uh, that we have. Yeah, no, no, and and people like him and. Sometimes we, we pigeonhole people to, that they only do one thing, but, you know, he's one of those other people who are amazing. I mean, I mean and being a visionary also and, and being so creative, this is fantastic news. I remember, you remember our, our dear friend, uh, Arnie Lang, who was uh, in New York, who, who left us uh, not so long ago, and unfortunately, he was a, a one, another one of those that he, no matter, he, I think he was 90 years old, right, when he... When he passed, yeah. and he was th he was like a little kid and always creating, always looking for projects, and he had contacted me, um, and a couple of years ago, to do a project in Cuba. He had he said, listen, Aldo, there's a, a, a the ionization piece by, you know, Varese, um, was premiered in New York and Havana the same year. I I believe it was 1934. So he said, how about I come to your festival that you, you're involved in, in in Havana and I do a master class for the classical percussionists and we, we do a performance there the same year that we do the performance in New York because he had his Irish people that used to come and he always had a, a, a project with them. He said, I, I have that. I'm, I'm preparing to do that, but why don't we do that in New York? I said, absolutely. So I got into the... I got into the into that project, and I said, "Well, when I went down to, to Havana, I, I I met with the people at ESA, which is the um, masters and, and a PhD level conservatory, 
And I said, do you know the piece? Of course they knew the piece, but they didn't have the score. They didn't have some of the instruments like the sleigh bells, the, uh, the sirens, and there are a number of instruments they didn't have. So with, with, with Arne, I said, okay, let's put together the, the instruments that are needed, give me the score. So we organized, getting everything down there, and then we were just about ready to do that. But that was, you know, at 90 years old, being a visionary who was always open to doing something new and something, and just keep going. I mean, what an energy, you know? And right. Amazing. And he was doing the same thing, building instruments and uh, uh, putting musicians and percussionists into contact with each other. He was a juggernaut, ne never, never stopped, and he was unflappable. There was no way that you could get Arnie Lang to e either uh, 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 be negative. Uh, there was no way to find any negativity or criticism um, other than what was meant to be helpful and to be supportive. And he was very unique in that. Um, he, he had inspired so many people, and I include myself, and I know, Aldo, you feel the same way, to keep reaching and to keep evolving and to keep learning. Um, he, he, was, he was the man. Yeah, and we greatly, greatly miss his influence, but it'll always be with us. Yeah, and, and of course he had that influence and, and kind of uh, um, justified, no, I shouldn't say justified, helped us push our own selves because I know I'm, I'm, I'm somewhat like that and I know you're definitely like that. And so when you have people that are much older than you and have been there for so long, New York Philharmonic all of these years, he was one of the first people to do world music and be so open to it. Uh, at very early ages and your stages, and you're looking around and you see if these guys are pushing that, then it kind of helps you out, pave the way so that you can you can speak the way you speak and and come up with projects that come to mind and and do it because there are guys like that who will back you up, <laughs> you yeah. know. Yeah, that, and, and that's what Arnie did. He backed you up. You could you you that was perfectly put. Yeah. It's, it's amazing. Thank you. Well. And but uh, so what, what are you um, what are you working on now? Besides, I, I know you have a, a production company, you uh, you a rental company. I mean, you're a, an entrepreneur besides being a, a great artist, which I I admire. I, I like people who are large vision. I enjoy that. Well, uh, since we're uh, we're talking about Arnie, uh, Pablo Rieppi has a series of timpani solos that he wrote. One of them is called Morris Morris Tans, Morris Dance, and uh, Pablo has invited me to record it. Um, and he has uh, some other real iconic timpanists uh, who are going to record his other pieces. But it's a collection of twelve solos that Pablo's going to publish and put out with video. So. That's very high on my list of things that I that I got to get to, and um, yeah, New York is you know we're coming back and there's lots of concerts, a uh, uh, lot of productions going on, and indeed I'm in I'm in deeply involved in the New York uh, music scene, both as a contractor and uh, as a performer myself. So as we head into December here. We've got we got lots of concerts at Carnegie Hall going on and uh, and the different venues. So it's it's nice to be back. And it, uh, for the most part, everybody is we're all being very safe. And as far as health goes, that has become now the number one priority for all of us to remain safe and keep each other safe and healthy. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that's important. I mean, I mean, one thing that the lockdown and the, that whole COVID situation did was Many of us turned, as, as you learned, uh, spent a lot of time in hip-hop. A lot of us did things that normally we wouldn't have time for. We, we might have been a, an interest here or an interest there, but really not have the time, physical time, to be able to do uh, certain things. I know in my case, I had a whole bunch of inventions that I had put in drawers, and I even had prototypes all set, but you know, doing the paperwork and all the... All of that just was not possible. So in COVID, I started a number of other things. You know, one of them being I finally patented some of the, some of the things, and one that you, you know of my my stand music stand that goes onto a um, 
mallet instrument, the mallet instrument hang stand that uh, Manhasset is manufacturing right now. So I'm, I'm really happy about that. So that was <laughs> the positive in the negative. And you just can't sit on your head. So, um, and you do things, and uh, you do things that we're you're not normally able to do, but the creative doesn't stop, right, John? I just played uh, Stancia, and I and I uh, was on a a walk with with my wife Anna, and I said, "Sweetheart, I can't get this tune out of my head." I mean, that's 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 the plight of our of our lives and and it's meant to be you know of course very nice but yeah it the, it's the music that drives it all um along with the relationships with our buddies with our friends and with the new folks that we're going to meet as a result of uh, of playing music together yeah it's it's a, it's an astonishing career and and life to have and i highly recommend it for those who are uh Strong back and <laughs> uh, and strong of will. That's right. Yes. Well, I thank you so much, uh, Jonathan, for for joining me on this and, and taking the time to to do this because it's it, it obviously it's a, it's a lot of work, especially in New York, and you're so busy teaching and and doing all the things that you do. I really appreciate this. Thank you. Uh, it, it's my pleasure, Naldo. You you do know that when you call, we come. So <laughs> thank you. That's that's a. Uh, that's heartfelt. I mean, I, I, I thank you. And I thank you for being there, by the way. Always. <laughs> to be continued. <laughs>